Hey, Crossroads family, Pastor Daniel here. I have a guest speaker for you today, somebody who you know and love, somebody who's been on our staff for a number of years. Pastor Greg Young came on our staff. He's got a gift of construction. He was actually our director of building services for a number of years. But what many people don't know is that Pastor Greg, he had been a lead pastor for many years and a youth pastor. And so when Pastor Greg came on our staff and was working in our building services department, right away we saw, man, this guy's a pastor. He's using our building to pastor our staff and to pastor people. And over the last six months, or so, Greg has been transitioning from our director of building services onto our pastoral team in the area of connections, and now we're also transitioning him into the area of care and benevolence. So Pastor Greg is one of my favorite Bible teachers. He's a great man and always shares a great word with us. So give Pastor Greg Young a warm crossroads welcome. We love you, Pastor Greg. Eight. 8,733, that's the number I came up with. Say, I wish that was in my savings account after Christmas. Actually, that's the number of lunches that I figure that I've prepared, uh, brown bag kind of guy that I am over the last 34 years of work. Um, that's a lot of turkey sandwiches. That's a lot of bologna and turkey and the same thing in and out, day in and day out. As I was thinking through the process of this message and talking about being a blue-collar person, a blue-collar worker, I was thinking about all of those lunches. And the lunches really don't make you blue-collar, do they? Um, it's where you eat those lunches that really make you blue-collar. As I was thinking back on all of my work history, I think about the times that I was eating those lunches on a tractor on a little farm down in southern Oregon or on a hay trailer or the tailgate of an old Chevy pickup out in the middle of a field somewhere. Or about sitting on a case of freight at 2.30 in the morning at uh, Sherm's Thunderbird Market down in, in, in Medford in the Rogue Valley eating that bologna or turkey sandwich. Thinking about sitting on the side of a hillside somewhere on a job site, uh, on a construction site, sitting on a bucket, enduring the weather. That, that's, that's glamorous break room there. You're out on the side of a hill, you turn a bucket over and you sit there for 30 minutes and you eat your lunch together. You see, I really relate to this guy we're gonna talk about today, Peter, um, we're gonna check his story out. I just love the Word of God. There's so many ways to get at it, isn't there? So many ways for us to, to study it, to take it in, to grow in it, to learn. We can do word studies, we can do inductive studies, we can, do, we can go verse by verse all the way through, we can take topics or, or books of the Bible, or we can do what I've really enjoyed, the way I really enjoy studying at times is, is to take a character in the, in the Word and just really study his life and his contribution or her life and her contribution out and what, how the Lord used them. And, and that's how we're going to get at this today is we're going to take a few moments from the life of Peter. There's so many things to talk about in his life, you know, very central figure in the, the foundation of the brand new church and, and how the Lord really poured into Peter, a very blue collar guy. I can relate to this guy. He would have packed a brown bag lunch and he would have eaten his lunch on the seashore or perhaps in the boat in the middle of the night. Doubt if he had a turkey sandwich, he probably had some sardines and crackers or something. But he's a blue collar guy, a guy that you wouldn't expect the Lord to use like he did. And to get at three moments in his life today, three things, three times, there are literally dozens, but I'm just gonna select out these three today, and those three are the call, the walk, and I'm gonna call the third one the smarts. The call, the walk, and the smarts. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11 says this. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake 
of Genezareth and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon the fisherman answered and said to him, Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Sounds like my kind of fishing trip. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So, then they had, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. The call. An ordinary fishing day ends up very extraordinary in the life of Peter, and James, and John, and Andrew, doesn't it? In fact, here's the picture. They've, they've spent all night in the boat. They've, they've toiled, and they have went after the elusive fish. Now, I'm really good at hunting or fishing. I'm not so good sometimes at catching or shooting what I'm after. You know what I mean? I, I'm really good at going after it, but sometimes I'm not as successful as I would like to be. And this is where Peter and, and the guys find themselves. It was a, a night that they worked all night in the boat, and they were tired. Anybody like me ever spent any time on graveyard? In fact, the first nine years of my working career, I, I worked graveyard. And uh, by this, when, when the sun starts coming up in the morning, it's time for you to go home and get some sleep. You begin to feel exhaustion, and, and your eyes feel like they have sand in them, and you're, you're, you're just burned out and tired, and that's exactly where they are. They're just finishing up, cleaning up the nets after the, after the fishing adventure that yielded nothing. James and John are, are mending the nets, in another boat. They're, they're working on the, on the seashore. They're tired. They're exhausted. And here comes this multitude of people with Jesus down to the seashore. And I could just hear them thinking, oh no, here we go. Now what? I just want to go home. But Jesus says, I need to borrow your boat, Peter. I need to borrow your boat, Simon. Uh, I've got to get out so that I can teach these people. And so Peter opens up to the Lord his boat and he gets in with him and they row out a little distance. I just love that about the Lord. There's a couple things. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this thought process. But one is, is, is just how wise, of course he is, he's God, but how wise Jesus is to use the boat for a speaking platform. He's going to speak to the people. He needs to get away from them slightly and he's going to use the lake, the surface of the lake to let the, the water be a, a natural magnification of his voice. So as he's speaking to the people, he's sitting there in the boat. Here's Peter keeping him in his place. And the message happens. He speaks to the people as, as only Jesus can. And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, let's go out a little ways and I want you to drop down your nets. And Peter, the good, hard-headed fisherman, you got to be a little hard-headed to be a fisherman, don't you? you got to be a little bit stubborn. You've got to have calluses on your hands and a wind-burned face and a little bit more determination than just the average Joe because the sea doesn't yield the catch very easy, does it? And this would have been the kind of guys they were. They would have understand the fishing times. They would have understand the weather. They would have, they would have Peter actually... And, and Andrew, their father was a fisherman. So this would have come about, this fishing career would have come about very naturally to them. So here's the Lord. 
the carpenter, <laughs> and he's going to advise Peter on fishing. And I want you to notice something about Peter. Is, as strong of a guy is, you can see that all throughout his life. You can see that lived out many times. As, as quick to act as he was, Peter recognized something in the Lord that, that was significant, and that was he let him know, we've already fished all night, Lord, but very well, I'm going to do what you ask me to do. So they paddle out a little ways further, and he drops down the net. See, their fishing style in that day was to use nets with weights on the edges and to broadcast them out and to let them sink down and then to bring them up. Sometimes they would go into the water to bring them up. Other times they would, they would yard them up really quickly with a line. So it was all done by hand. These guys were very strong. He cast the net out on the side that the Lord tells him, and we know the story. It's an overwhelming catch. It's a catch that, like none other that they've seen, this isn't just, hey, we got a few fish in the net. It's going to literally overwhelm them, so much so that they're not going to fit in one boat. So Peter calls for his partners on the shore to bring out the other boat. They bring it out to them so that, that they can handle this catch. So they do, they bring it out and they pile the fish in. I can just see this, here's these guys. Think about, think about this, this picture for a moment. There are fish all around you. You are covered in fish. I mean, Jesus must just have a great big grin on his face at this point. He's just like, and Peter's like, I don't believe this. The boat is overwhelmed. The second boat is completely full to the point of them almost sinking. They manage to get the fish in and they head to shore. And they get, get these boats to shore without sinking them. And the Lord, they, they're just overwhelmed. In fact, Peter's so overwhelmed, he said, I'm not worthy to even be in your presence, basically. He's just saying, I'm a sinner. He recognized the miracle as this, this is Jesus. This is, this is way bigger than anything I've ever seen before. I've never, I've never experienced a catch like this. I've never been around a guy like this. And Jesus says to him, do not be afraid, for now you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. There are so many things that we could talk about this morning, but the one thing I want you to grasp out of this moment in Peter's life is that he held very loosely to this world. Peter held very loosely to this world. In fact, we see that, don't we? When he made available his boat, even when he was exhausted at the end of his regular work, work day, when he felt like going home and kicking his feet up, he didn't do that. He made his boat and himself available to Jesus. He held loosely to the things that, that had been entrusted to him. He held loosely to what was available to him. And I would challenge you in this very first Sunday of 2016, let the Lord speak to your heart about this. What is it that he would have you, that he's entrusted into your hands, what would he have you hold loosely to this year? What would he have you make available to him for his services and his purposes? You say, well, what are you talking about? What is it that the Lord has entrusted you? Perhaps it's in your business. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe you have a shop of tools somewhere and the Lord would speak to you that, that you need to make those available for his, his work. Maybe, may, just fill in the blank. Maybe you have a, a hair salon and the Lord would, would call you to make that available for some purpose. Maybe you have whatever the maybe you have is. Maybe you have a chainsaw and a pickup truck. And you say, I want to make that available. You see, that's what Peter, that's, that's how basic, that's what this blue collar fisherman guy did, is he made available to the Lord exactly what the Lord, what he had to make available. That was his boat. We also see that Peter held very loosely to his own wisdom, didn't he? Now, I don't know if you've, 
Any of you watch Deadliest Catch and the skippers on Deadliest Catch, but you go out and try to tell them as a greenhorn, somebody that knows nothing about fishing, where they should fish and see how far you get. <laughs> That's exactly what Jesus did, is he told Peter to go out further and to fish on the other side of the boat. Peter let him know that he knew better than that, but he held loosely to his knowledge, and he said, okay, we're going to do it. He was obedient. Sometimes we need to check our wisdom at the door and hold it loosely for the sake of the wisdom of our Heavenly Father and for his purposes, amen? Sometimes we can have all of the knowledge within ourselves that said, there's no way this thing's going to work. There's no way we're going to catch fish there. There's no way I should go there. There's no way you would have me speak to that person. There's no way you would have me do that thing. The Lord would say, check your knowledge at the door. Hold loosely to your opinion. Hold loosely to your skills. Put them in the hands of the Lord. And thirdly, ultimately, Peter Andrew, James, and John completely held loosely to the family business, didn't they? Now, to be a fisherman in that day, they had a very good business. They were not the poorest of the poor, certainly. They had, there, there was a high demand for fresh fish. Can you imagine? There's no refrigeration, so it, fresh fish were in high demand. It, you had to eat it quickly. It was a great source of protein and a part of everyone's diet. It would have been a very lucrative business for these guys. They, they knew the fish. They knew they had the wisdom. They had the equipment. They had everything that they needed, and they were successful in their fishing business. The two brothers fishing company was doing well. And yet the Lord speaks to them and says, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And it says that they literally laid aside everything and went and followed Jesus. I really like that. Uh, that's not easy to do, is it? That's easy to preach, that's easy to talk about. It's easy to look in other people's lives and say, you really should do that. It's quite another different story when you do that yourself, isn't it? When you are willing to set aside everything for what the Lord is calling you to, to call you out of where you are into something that you didn't even understand. And these guys simply set their most valuable possessions aside, their family business, and said, I value what Jesus is telling me. I value the, the souls of men above the fish. They didn't even get tripped up on the biggest catch of their career. I want you to get that for a moment. They simply left it in someone else's hands and said, you take care of the fish, we're going to follow Jesus. So even their success that day didn't trip them up to following the Lord. 2016, I think that that's a good formula for us, amen? That we don't allow anything in our life to stop us from walking where Jesus calls us to walk, from going where Jesus calls us to go, from being willing to do and to speak what Jesus is calling us to do and to speak. Like Peter. <laughs> I mean, this was in him. This was all he knew. This would have been walking away from a life training, a career, it would have put the family business perhaps in jeopardy. He had a wife, we know. He had a family to support. And he didn't let any of those things stop him from taking the next step with Jesus. Hold lightly to what you have in this world for the sake of the kingdom. The second moment in the life of Peter that I want to talk about today, I call the walk Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he sent multitudes away, and he went, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, 
But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they, try, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter got, had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when, Jesus saw, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The walk. I mean, here's, here you go. Jesus sends them out again in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. After an exhausting day of ministry, Jesus wants some time alone. You ever feel like that? You want some time alone? After the holidays, the house full, people pressing in on all sides, you just want some time alone. But Jesus had just given out. The disciples had just given out. They were all exhausted as the people had pressed in. And Jesus wanted to retreat to the mountain to uh, spend some time with his father. And so he instructed the disciples to head across the sea in the boat. It's not like Jesus didn't realize what was going on here, right? He knew they were going to run into a storm. He knew all of this was going to happen, but he did it anyway. He sent them out. There's a, there's a powerful lesson here. In fact, there's multitudes of lessons here. I encourage you to break this open yourself when you have time and really dig into this and invite the Spirit of God to speak to your heart through it. But So here they are. Between, somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. How many of you know the middle of the night can be the time of biggest fear and biggest opposition? Anybody ever experience that? Anybody experience those, those times when the enemy really begins to beat on you and work on you and, and overwhelm you and maybe you suffer a little bit from insomnia? I've never suffered from insomnia in my life until about a year and a half ago. I've always worked and, and always my claim was I could sleep anywhere with those graveyard jobs and multiple jobs and very physical jobs that I've worked. I could fall asleep at, a, at the drop of a hat, but in the last couple years I've been battling through insomnia and two, three, and four o'clock in the morning is often the time that, that I'm up and I'm trying to figure out why I'm up and I know the next day is going to be a long day and the harder you try to go back to sleep, the, the tougher it is. It's also a time where, where the enemy will work on you and, and begin to try to discourage you with your, in your thoughts or you'll feel overwhelmed about all kinds of situations in your life only to wake up later and realize, wow, it's not really as bad as I imagined it at three or four o'clock in the morning. But here they are, three or four o'clock in the morning. They're in the middle of a significant storm, and Jesus walks on the water to meet them. My surprise really here isn't that Jesus walked on the water. It's really that Jesus ever rode in a boat. I mean, stop and really think about it for a minute. Why should we be surprised that Jesus walked across the Sea of Galilee? <laughs> He's the son of God. He made water. <laughs> he spoke this thing into existence, and now him simply walking on it <laughs> was just another day. It's just what he has the ability to do. And, and, and I want you to really think about that in your own life for just a moment, that there is nothing in this physical world that, that Jesus does not have the ability to walk on, so to speak, to overcome, so to speak, to be able to tread on. I really like that about the Lord because I face things in this world that, that, there, that I have no ability to do anything about physically and humanly, but I know that the God that I serve walks on water. He not only walks on the water, he's the one that put it all into existence and holds it in the balance. 
We shouldn't be surprised that Jesus walked on the water. We should be surprised, really, that Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, actually ever got in a boat with man. And he did that for us. So again, this is very familiar territory. These guys in that boat, Peter, would have known this lake inside and out, this sea. He would have known how to navigate in a storm. This was familiar territory. This wasn't something that would have caught him off guard. They would have, they would have been working their very hardest to keep the boat square with the waves and to embrace the wind head on. They would have been battling this thing for all their worth because they were fishermen. They were men of the sea. They knew what the Sea of Galilee was capable of. And so they were headed into the storm, and here comes Jesus walking out to them in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the storm. Fishermen are a superstitious bunch, and they don't recognize Jesus at first. You know, they think he's a ghost. And there's a lot of times I don't recognize Jesus in the middle of my storm either. It takes me a bit to recognize that Jesus is really in the middle of it with me. It takes me a bit sometimes, whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm going through, to recognize that Jesus is actually in the middle of the storm with me. Even though I've been walking with him for a long time, sometimes I can miss the fact that he's right there with me, and all I gotta do is call out to him. But he speaks to them and tells them, to, to be of good cheer, it's I. Peter, <laughs> the brazen one that he is, says, well, if it really is you, call me out of the boat. Now, no fisherman in their right mind is going to climb out of a perfectly good boat in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, right? It's just not going to happen. But here are these guys. The waves are pounding. Peter says, if it's, if it's really you, Lord, I want to come to you. And he gets out of the boat, and he heads right to the Lord. Now, Peter gets a lot of criticism because he doubts partway and goes under, and the Lord rescues him, right? But I'm here to tell you that he went partway on the top of the water. He went partway across the top of the sea. Now, you try that, even one step, you're not getting very far, right? There's a pond out back on the east side here. Just try it after church today. Try taking more than one step on that pond. Peter took several steps on the sea. You're partway out there. Now, now you gotta picture this. He's in familiar territory, but he has an unfamiliar view of the familiar territory. He has never looked at that sea the same way before or probably since that walk on the top of that water. First of all, he's looking back at his buddies in the boat. <laughs> he's in completely new territory in a very familiar place. And I just really felt very strongly today about 2016 as I was working through this. The Lord in the familiar place. I pray that I would see it from a vantage point that is completely unique this year. In the familiar place. You know the familiar place. Maybe it's your nine to five job that you've been going to for 18 years straight. Maybe it's the same house you've lived in all your life. Maybe whatever it is, it's very, very familiar and comfortable, a place where you're very much at home. You, would, you, would have, you understand everything about it. Lord, would you call me out of the normal in my ordinary place? Lord, would you take me out of the same vantage point that I've always had in this place? Would you allow me to see the sea and my life from a different angle? 
You see, when we walk with the Lord and when we spend time with him, really what his desire for us, Jesus de desires his disciples to imitate him, don't, doesn't he? He wants us to go where he's going and to do what he's doing. It wasn't a stretch for Jesus to call Peter out of the boat and to have him walk right out into the, into the sea with him. But to Peter, it was completely getting out of his normal routine to do that. It was taking a giant step of faith to do that, literally, as he walked on the water. And what would the Lord have you to do in 2016? What would he have me to do in 2016? Where would he call me out of my comfort zone, out of my familiar? Maybe it's right in your own home. Maybe today after this service or after the next service, the Lord's calling you to make your very home available. And you would go to the kiosk, the welcome center out in the, in the lobby, and you would Sign up to be a home group host at your home. Familiar place that now you're seeing with different lenses, something really tangible. It's just, a, just one idea. Maybe it would speak to your heart that you should be a small group, a community group leader, which would be a completely new way of being in a familiar place, but looking at it with different eyes, seeing it from a different angle, seeing it from a different position. So Peter was, was bold. He got out there. And I just love it that even when he started going under the Lord, I, he just seems to me like Jesus must have had a smile on his face. Oh, Peter, why did you doubt? Reaches out, pulls him out of the water, gets him back in, they get back in the boat together. And I just think, Lord, help me in the thing that I've been doing for so long to begin to see you. Maybe it's your next door neighbor that you've lived next to for 25 years who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe whatever, you fill in the blank. Something, someone or something that's very familiar that the Lord is going to call you out of where you've been and what you've done. The third moment in Peter's life is what I call the smarts. One thing about being blue collar, one of the, one of the trademarks of being blue collar is that, that you've had more, probably more on the job training than you've had formal education. Peter would not have been to the University of Jerusalem at this point, he would have been to the School of Hard Knocks. He would have learned from the fishermen ahead of him. They would have learned from the correct way to, to fish by failure. <laughs> they would have learned a lot of things by trial and error. But an amazing thing happens in chapter 16 of Matthew. They're in the region two and a half years later after Peter says yes and Andrew and they're all following Jesus and they're his disciples and they're doing all kinds of things that Jesus does. They're praying all kinds of prayers that Jesus prays. They're, they're involved in the work of the ministry. They're seeing things happen that they could not believe. And here in chapter 16 of Matthew, verse 13, it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea of Philippi, let me tell you, that's a beautiful place if you ever get to go to Israel and to, the, to Galilee. It's just an incredible place. He asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So here's the deal, two and a half years of ministry, walking with Jesus, spending time with him, doing what Jesus has done, 
They go to the very northern region of Galilee to a place called Caesarea Philippi, this gorgeous place where literally one, this giant rock granite wall and literally one of the, the arms of the Jordan River flows right out of the side of the mountain. It's, it's an incredibly beautiful place. But they weren't there for, just there for that beauty. Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says, so what is everyone's take on who, they, who I am? Who do people say that I am? What's the, what's the talk around town about who people say that I am? And so the guys answered, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or other prophets. The forerunner to the Messiah. You're a good teacher. You are, you're, you, you are all of these things. And then he looks at them and he says this, and this is a very pivotal, pivotal question. He says, yeah, but who do you say I am? Peter boldly proclaims to him and says, you are the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one, the deliverer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are not the forerunner to the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the son of God. You are the deliverer. You are the redeemer. You are who was promised in, from, from Isaiah and all the prophets. You are the one who has been promised the coming king, the redeemer. You are who you say you are. You are the Messiah. Proclaims it. Gets it. Jesus looks at him and say, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. <laughs> but my Father who is in heaven, I love that. So here's this fisherman, this blue collar guy, the one with calluses and a weathered face, the one that knew all about the sea and fishing and the boat, had never been to any university, and yet he's the guy that gets it. He speaks who, the, who Jesus is. He says, you are the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah. You are the anointed one. I love that. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, didn't withhold the knowledge of who he is from any of us, does he? And when, he, when Jesus looks at Peter and says, you, Simon Barjona, literally what he's saying is, you, O fisherman from the Sea of Galilee, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but this was revealed to you by my Father. I love that because the, the Lord that we serve today entrusts into our hands wisdom and knowledge that, that we don't deserve, certainly, and that we could never really grasp in our own. You know, if you're walking with the Lord, if you're spending time with him, that that's gonna increase your WQ, your WQ, your wisdom quotient. Maybe you don't have the highest IQ in the world. Maybe you would not have made it through the University of Jerusalem or any other university. Maybe you feel very insignificant, but I'm here to tell you today that the Lord by his Holy Spirit will reveal things to you about who he is that, that the world could only dream of today. I love that. We don't have to walk in the wisdom of men. We get to walk as followers of Christ in the wisdom of God, in the knowledge of who he is and his plans for us. And not only that, but he entrusts us into our ordinary hands the very gospel the good news that the Messiah has come, that the Redeemer has come. He's entrusted it into to hands like my hands and your hands. Very common, sometimes very blue collar. A lot of brown bag lunches made in my lifetime. A lot of sitting in very ordinary places. But this morning as I stand before you today, I know that by the Holy Spirit, he's, he's taught me things about who he is that only come from him. It's awesome. 
Let 2016 be one of those awesome years when you ask the Lord to give you wisdom in how to live your life, in how to walk through life, in how to do your life, in how to reach your neighbor, in how to speak to your children, in how to pray for the people in your lives. Ask the Lord to give you his wisdom for your life, and he will. He will increase your WQ as you spend time with him. Somehow, he could take the things of God and make them simple enough, his plans, and make them simple enough for a guy like me to get. A few years ago, I was talking with one of my, my daughters. I have four kids. Um, they're all married and doing well, and we have our eighth grandbaby on the way. Who can believe that? It's just a joy ride. Once the grandkids come, it's good stuff, right? You survived. You've got to the reward, so to speak. I was sitting talking to my youngest daughter, and uh, she has a science mind and did really well in college and, and graduated uh, with a degree in organic chemistry and went on to grad school in the studies of organic chemistry. Now, that's about as far as my knowledge goes in organic chemistry. One day I sat with Jennifer, and I said, Jennifer, could you explain to your dad one thing about organic chemistry? One thing. And she thought real, she thought real hard. <laughs> she said, I'm not sure if I can find one thing. She said, I'm working on this research on nano bubbles. Nano bubbles. I said, nano, that's tiny, and bubbles, I get that. Nano bubbles. So that was, that's my entire knowledge of organic chemistry. My mind just doesn't grasp organic chemistry. It doesn't grasp a lot of those things. It's, it's not, I'm not wired that way. I'm not made up that way. Praise the Lord, there are people out there that, that that's just their passion and their, their sweet spot, but it's not mine. But I'm here today to tell you that even though I cannot understand one thing about organic chemistry, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and a walk with him, I can understand the things of eternity. I can grasp the gospel, so to speak. I just don't completely understand it, but I certainly relish in it and live in it and walk in it. I can have communion with creator God and fellowship with God, and I know that my knowledge of him and my walk with him is going to grow this year as I spend time with him because of who he is, not because of my smarts. So when Jesus says, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. I want you to put your name in that slot. And I want you to realize that the God of this universe has wisdom for you to live your life, even if it seems very common and ordinary, even if it's very brown bag lunch kind of ordinary, even if it doesn't seem to be very significant. The, the God of this universe has wisdom for you in his word that he wants to reveal to you in this year and every year of your life to help you to navigate, to help you to reach people who are lost, to help you to grow in your faith, to help you lead your family and to lead your neighbors and lead the people that God has put in your path to him. He wants to reveal who he is deeper and deeper and further and further to you. Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Wow. I don't even know quite what to do with that, right? But I certainly am going to grab a hold of it and take advantage of it, amen? In this world that we live in, 
We need that wisdom, don't we? We need that understanding. We need that Holy Spirit power. We need direction. I need to know when to move to the right or the left. I need to know when to paddle the boat out a little farther and drop down the net. I need to know when to sell and when to buy. I need to know what to do in my life and when to speak and when to be quiet. I need to have that wisdom that only comes from our Father. Flesh and blood has not, this didn't come from flesh and blood. This didn't come from the fishing school. This didn't come from the grocery school. This didn't come from the carpenter school. This didn't come from the farmer school. This comes from the very heart of God through the Holy Spirit for very, very common people. <laughs> I love that. I love it. I'm qualified, amen? 8,733 lunches later. Hallelujah. I'm qualified. It's a great plan. This is going to be a great year in him, amen? It doesn't matter what we face this year. If we're walking with him and in his wisdom, it's going to be a great year. May I invite the usher, or <laughs> invite the usher let me invite the worship team out. I think the ushers have already been here. Let's invite the worship team back out as we conclude this message today. On this, the, the very first Sunday in 2016, we need to hold loosely to this world. We need to be imitators of Jesus. And we need to spend time with him and let our WQ increase, amen? Allow him to use you in ways this year that you would have never dreamed of. If I could only have the time to tell you today what it means for me to be standing here in this room proclaiming his word and his truth to you, because of his goodness, because of his grace, because of his wisdom, because of his call, because of his faithfulness. It's all about him, amen? It's all about him. Let's bow our heads in as we conclude today. Father, we're just all so blessed and blown away to be here today to uh, have a chance to be in your house on this, the first Sunday in 2016. And Lord, I know in this room that every one of us carry things. We have things in our lives that, <laughs> Lord, we need your wisdom in. But maybe, Lord, there's, there's some here who don't know you. And what a way to start 2016. Lord, I pray right now that you would just, by your Holy Spirit, speak to their hearts. <laughs> 